In this video, I want to tell you about a fascinating connection in physics between the position and momentum of a quantum mechanical particle that's captured by the Fourier transform. And to unpack where this incredibly important formula comes from and what it means in the context of quantum mechanics. Now, the Fourier transform was of course written down long before the discovery of quantum mechanics, and it has a million applications across all kinds of topics in physics and many other fields. But what I want to show you is that if by some twist of fate, the Fourier transform hadn't been studied prior to the beginnings of quantum mechanics in the early 1900s, it still would have inevitably been discovered once we attempted to understand the strange and fascinating laws of the quantum world. And in doing so, we're going to understand the underlying idea behind this somewhat intimidating looking mathematical expression and how it comes about so naturally in quantum mechanics how it gives us a map between two parallel descriptions of quantum mechanics, one in terms of the wave function, psi of x, and a dual description in terms of what's called the momentum space wave function, psi hat of k. And if you stick around to the end, you'll also see how all this math inevitably leads us to the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, which is one of the most fundamental features of quantum mechanics. Of course, I want you to be able to appreciate all this, even if you're not already an expert with the strange rules of quantum mechanics. And so, for the purposes of this video, you'll mainly need to know two things going in. Number one, that a quantum particle is described by its wave function, psi of x, which is a function that assigns a number to each point x in space, a complex number in general, and which tells us the probability of where we'll find the particle when we go to measure its position. In particular, the probability of finding the particle at position x within a little window of width dx is given by the square of the wave function times the little width dx. That's the first fact about quantum mechanics that we'll need. And the second is that the momentum for a quantum mechanical wave function is described by an operator p that acts on the wave function by taking its derivative, d by dx, times an overall factor. H bar here is Planck's constant, which is the fundamental physical constant of quantum mechanics. And i equals the square root of minus 1 is the imaginary number. As we'll see shortly, it's there to ensure that the numbers we predict when we actually measure the momentum come out to be real. Because again, the wave function itself is in general going to be complex. We'll better understand what this formula means as we go along. But for now, these are the two main facts about quantum mechanics that we need going into this video. And by the way, if you're new around here, you can get the notes that I've written going over all of this at the link down in the description, and those go into more detail about everything in this video. So pull them up after you've watched. For now though, we're ready to begin to discover how all this is connected to the mathematics of the Fourier transform. So here's our particle again, living on the x-axis. But actually, we're going to start off by thinking about a quantum mechanical particle living on a circle of radius r instead of the infinite real line. Living on a circle like this is going to make the math a little bit easier to begin with. And then later on, we'll see what happens when we go back to the infinite x-axis. But what living on a circle means is that if you decide to go out for a little walk, after you've traveled a distance of 2 pi r, you'll look around and discover that you're just back where you originally started. And so the coordinates x and x plus 2 pi r describe the same point in this circular space. As far as our quantum mechanics goes, what this means is that the wave function has to take the same value at x and at x plus 2 pi r. That way, if you write down the wave function somewhere, and then take a lap around the circle, you'll still find the same value when you get back to where you started. So, for example, suppose we took psi of x equals x. That wouldn't be allowed here, since when you take a walk over by 2 pi r, the value of the function changes. But if we took something like cosine of x over r, we're golden, because now a trip by 2 pi r from any starting point brings us back to the same value of the cosine. Then what this condition is saying is that for a particle living on a circle, the wave function has got to be periodic with this period 2 pi r, like say a cosine or a sine. In fact, speaking of sines and cosines, the fact that our wave function is periodic means that under very general conditions, we can expand it as a sum of sines and cosines using a Fourier series. This isn't the Fourier transform yet, that'll come soon. For now, we're just talking about the ordinary Fourier series that lets us expand most any periodic function as a sum of sines and cosines. 
For instance, here's a simple example of a wave function for a particle that's localized in a little window. Inside this interval, psi is just a constant. And so the particle has an equal chance of being found anywhere inside this range. But outside this window, the wave function goes to zero, and so we'll never find the particle there. We can make this wave function periodic simply by demanding that it repeats itself over and over again. And that way, we can write down its Fourier series. To first approximation, it just looks like a cosine function. But as we include more terms in the series, you can see how quickly it begins to close in on the shape of the wave function. This idea is really powerful, and it's the foundation of everything we're going to discuss in this video. Each term in the Fourier series is just a simple sinusoidal function, a wave that oscillates up and down forever. But when we add them together, the waves interfere with each other, constructively in some places and destructively in others. And we're left with a close approximation to our actual wave function, here including just five terms in the sum. Now, cosines and sines can actually be a little bit awkward to work with. So for our purposes here, it'll be more convenient to write the Fourier series in terms of exponentials, like e to the i theta. And we can do that thanks to Euler's identity, which says that e to the i times something equals cosine of the thing plus i times the sine of the thing. And that lets us go back and forth between sines and cosines and exponentials. That enables us to write the Fourier series much more conveniently like this. This is the same expansion, we've just rearranged it a bit, and now we're writing the coefficients as psi sub n. So let's take some time to unpack what's going on here. Each term in this sum is a wave, which I'll write as e to the i k x, with k equals n over r, an integer divided by the radius of the circle. They're complex waves because thanks again to Euler's identity, we can write e to the i kx as cosine of kx plus i times sine kx. So the real part is the wave cosine kx, and the imaginary part is sine kx, which is the same wave. It's just shifted over from the cosine by 90 degrees. For each of these Fourier waves, e to the i kx in the sum, this number k is called the wave number of the wave. It's analogous to frequency, except that here we're talking about a wave that's oscillating in space, not time. So a big value of k means a wave that's oscillating very rapidly with a short wavelength, whereas a small value of k means a wave that's oscillating very slowly with a long wavelength. And the fact that the sum only includes the special values k equals n over r is critical here. We'll come back to the significance of that in a moment. But first, I want to show you how all this math ties back to the physics of the quantum mechanical momentum operator that we talked about at the beginning. Let's see what happens when we apply the momentum operator, p equals h bar over i d by dx, to one of the Fourier modes. The derivative will bring down a factor of i k from the exponent, and that i will cancel against the i in the denominator, leaving h bar k times e to the i k x. Something very special has happened here. When we apply the momentum operator to the Fourier wave, we get back the same function e to the i k x multiplied by a constant, h bar k. e to the i k x is called an eigenfunction of the momentum operator, and h bar k is called the corresponding eigenvalue. When you apply an operator to one of its eigenfunctions, by definition, you get back the same function times the eigenvalue. This is important. Because in quantum mechanics, the eigenvalues of an operator are the numbers that you can get back when you make a measurement of that quantity. And so when we measure the momentum of a Fourier wave, the value we'll find is Planck's constant h bar times the wave number k for that wave. Notice that those values are real, as we'd of course expect, since we're talking about a physical measurement here. That's why, by the way, we divided by i in the definition of the momentum operator. The i in the denominator cancels against the i that came down from the derivative of e to the i k x. So these Fourier waves are very special. They're the eigenfunctions of the momentum operator, and therefore each one describes a particle with definite momentum, h bar k. But in general, the total wave function won't be described by any single Fourier wave. It'll be given by a superposition of many such waves, all with those special wave numbers, k equals n over r. That's what the Fourier series expressed. It lets us write the wave function as a sum of individual Fourier waves with these different wave numbers, and therefore different momenta for each wave. 
And these coefficients psi n are the numbers that tell us how much each individual Fourier wave contributes to the total wave function. Then, when we go to measure the momentum of our particle, any of those wave numbers, k equals n over r, that appeared in the Fourier series are fair game. And we can potentially find any of those values, times h bar, for the momentum of the particle. The probability of getting each of those possible values is determined by how much it contributed to the total wave function, psi n squared. That's why the Fourier series is so closely connected to the momentum of our quantum particle. It tells us which momenta are contributing to the total wave function, and therefore the probabilities of what we'll find when we go to measure it. I'll explain how to actually find these coefficients, psi n, in just a minute. But first, we skimmed over a really important point earlier. Why are the wave numbers, and therefore the values of the momentum, only allowed to take these special values of an integer divided by r? The reason comes back to the fact that we've put our particle on a circular space here, where, as we discussed, the wave function has got to be periodic. Meanwhile, our Fourier waves are of course also periodic, but the periodicity of the waves has got to be compatible with the periodicity of the circular space. In other words, we need to be able to fit a whole number of wavelengths into the circumference of our circle. They're a little like the standing waves you may have learned about in high school physics, when you pin down the two ends of a string, except that these waves won't necessarily sit still in general as time goes on. If a whole number of wavelengths didn't fit into the length of our circle, like this where I've tried to squeeze in one and a half wavelengths, then when you take a walk all the way around and come back to where you started, the value of the wave will have changed and the function won't make any sense on our circle. In particular, when we shift x to x plus two pi r, corresponding to walking all the way around the circle, e to the i k x transforms into itself times e to the two pi i k r. So for arbitrary values of k, that's not going to be invariant. We only get a wave that's well-defined on our circle when e to the two pi i k r is equal to one. And that's where the condition that k r has got to be an integer n comes in. Because e to the two pi i times an integer is indeed equal to one. You can see that again from Euler's identity. e to the two pi i n is equal to cosine of two pi n plus i times sine of two pi n. And the angles we've got here, 2 pi n, those are 0, 2 pi, 4 pi, and so on, all of which have cosine equal to 1 and sine equal to 0. So that's why the wave numbers of our Fourier modes are restricted to be of this form, an integer divided by the radius of the circle. And correspondingly, that's why the momentum of the particle is quantized as h bar n over r. Abstractly, what this formula means is that the set of all the Fourier waves with these special values of k forms a basis for the space of square integrable functions on a circle. And those coefficients are telling us how much weight each Fourier mode contributes with. But we haven't actually discussed yet how we're supposed to figure out these coefficients psi n, and there's a beautiful trick for getting them. To see how, we'll start with the Fourier series and multiply each side by e to the minus i m x over r for some other integer m. And now what we're gonna do is integrate both sides of this equation over the circumference of our circle. That's from minus pi r to plus pi r. This looks a little complicated, but actually we get something very simple hiding here. On the right-hand side, we're doing the integral of e to the i n minus m times x over r over the circumference of the circle. But like we just discussed, we specifically chose these functions to ensure that a whole number of oscillations fit into the circumference. Then, when we do the integral of a periodic function like this over a whole number of periods, the positive parts of the area where the wave is above the x-axis precisely cancel the negative parts where it's below, and we get zero for the integral. Or at least, we usually get zero. There's one exception, and that's when n and m happen to be the same integer. Because in that special case, n minus m in the exponent vanishes, and we're just left with the integral of e to the zero, which is equal to one. And that integral just comes out to the circumference of the circle again, two pi r. So this complicated looking formula actually isn't all that complicated at all. Almost all the terms in this sum over n are equal to zero. The only non-zero term is the special one where n coincides with this other integer m that we chose. And so at the end of the day, 
all we're left with is 2 pi r times psi sub m. And now we've got our Fourier coefficients. We just divide this 2 pi r over to the other side, and we find that all we need to do to compute each Fourier coefficient is to take the wave function, multiply it by the complex conjugate Fourier wave, and then integrate that over the circle. And finally, we divide by the circumference, and that gives us the Fourier coefficient. And of course, m here is just another arbitrary label for an integer. We could just as well switch that back now to n like we were using before. So for our example of a wave function from earlier, you can evaluate those integrals, and you'll get a distribution of Fourier coefficients like this for the first handful of terms, where each data point here is telling us how much the Fourier wave e to the i k x with that particular value of k equals n over r is contributing to the given wave function. And when you add up those Fourier waves for these first few contributions to the series that I've plotted here, you'll get the approximation to the wave function that we drew earlier, which is already quite good. Okay, that was already a lot of information. And now we're ready to see how what we've learned about the quantum mechanics of the Fourier series extends to the full-fledged Fourier transform. But before that, let's quickly summarize the main things we've learned so far. First, a quantum mechanical particle is described by a wave function, psi of x, whose square tells us the probability of finding the particle at position x when we make a measurement. Second, that for a particle that lives on a circle, we can expand the wave function as a sum over Fourier waves, e to the i k x, with some appropriate coefficients, where k is forced to take the discrete values, k equals n over r, for any integer n. And third, that each individual Fourier mode has definite momentum, h bar k, and the probability of obtaining that value when we make a measurement of the whole wave function is determined by that mode's contribution to the Fourier series, squared. Notice, though, that there's a strange sort of asymmetry here between the position and the momentum. The particle can be found at any position x in space, while the momentum can only take these discrete values, like 0, h bar over r, 2 h bar over r, and so on. The origin of the discrepancy comes from making our space a circle. But now we're prepared to investigate what happens when we go back to studying our particle on the infinite x-axis. And in doing so, we're going to see that the Fourier transform falls out. We constructed our circle of radius r in the first place by identifying each pair of points on the real line that differed by a multiple of 2 pi r. But now we can go the other way if we like, just by sending r out to infinity. In that sense, the problem of a particle on a line is just a special limit of a particle on a circle. And in fact, we've really gotten most of the hard work out of the way already. So let's think about what happens in the r goes to infinity limit. First of all, we had found that the allowed values for the momentum were p equals h bar n over r. They came in this discrete lattice of points, one for each integer n, separated by h bar over r. But notice that in the limit r goes to infinity, that separation is going to zero. Then instead of a discrete lattice of possible momenta, we'll find a continuous line. Therefore, the particle in an infinite space can take any value for its momentum, just like it could for its position, eliminating the asymmetry between the two variables on a circle. Now let's see what happens to our Fourier series in the infinite radius limit. Here were our two key formulas from before for the series itself and the coefficients. First off, I'm just going to relabel things a little bit. Let me rewrite the coefficients as 1 over square root 2 pi r times psi hat of k. Whereas before, k equals n over r are the discrete values of the wave number. Putting in the 1 over r there is going to help us keep control over the r goes to infinity limit. And the factor of square root 2 pi is just a matter of convention. So these are the exact same formulas as before. All I've done is change the notation a little bit to make it clearer how we're going to take the r goes to infinity limit. And we can also simplify the coefficients here by bringing over the root 2 pi times r factor. And then that just leaves us with 1 over root 2 pi times this integral. There, that's our Fourier series for the wave function of a particle on a circle. And now we're ready to take the limit. Let's start off with the sum. Just like the momentum, our values of k equals n over r were originally spaced out on a discrete lattice, separated by delta k equals 1 over r. Now notice that we also have a 1 over r here in the Fourier series. 
Let's go ahead and replace that with this spacing, delta k. Good. Now what is this sum telling us to do? Well, we've got this function of k, 1 over root 2 pi, psi hat of k, times e to the i k x. And here's a cartoon of what it might look like. It's complex, of course, so let's say that this picture is the real part, and you could draw a similar picture of whatever the imaginary part happens to look like. Then what we're told to do here is to take the value of this function at each of these special points, k equals n over r. Then we're supposed to multiply that by the width delta k of each of these intervals. And that, of course, gives us the areas of this series of rectangles aligned at those discrete values of k. And finally, we're instructed to add all these areas up. Hopefully you see where this is going. As we let r get really, really big, the separation delta k is going to zero. And so the width of each rectangle is getting very skinny. Then, as we add up the areas of all these skinny rectangles between these ever more finely spaced values of k, we obtain the area under the curve. In other words, in the r goes to infinity limit, our discrete sum turns into an integral over all possible values of the continuous variable k. And that is the result of our Fourier series in the r goes to infinity limit. As for our other formula for the coefficients, that limit is even simpler. All that changes is that the bounds of the integral from minus pi r to plus pi r now extend out to plus or minus infinity. And there we have it. This pair of formulas defines the Fourier transform of the wave function, together with the inverse Fourier transform. And we found that it simply emerges from the Fourier series for the wave function on a circle, in the limit where the circle becomes infinitely large. But the understanding we developed by studying the quantum mechanics of a particle on a circle gives us a good intuition for making sense of the full-fledged Fourier transform in an infinite space which I think otherwise has got to look a little imposing the first time you see it. Because even though our discrete Fourier series from earlier has turned into an integral, the underlying idea is exactly the same as before. Each Fourier wave, e to the i k x, represents a state of definite momentum, h bar k. And what we're doing is writing a general wave function as a superposition of these basic waves. The only difference is that we had a discrete sum for a particle on a circle whereas now we get a continuous integral when we put the particle on a line. That again was because for the circle, we had to be able to fit a whole number of wavelengths inside the circumference. And that meant that k could only take these discrete values, n over r. Whereas on an infinite line, there's no constraint on the wavelength, and k can take any value it wants. It's a continuous parameter. And finally, these coefficients simply tell us how much of each individual wave we need to include in the sum in order to reproduce our given wave function. We wrote them as psi sub k, or psi sub n, in the circle case, because it was just a discrete list of numbers. But in the continuous case, it's a whole function of the continuous variable k, which is why I'm writing it like this, to indicate it's a function of k. And we throw a hat on there, just so that we don't get it confused with the original wave function. Now once again, since a general wave function is going to be a superposition of many different Fourier waves, each with its own momentum, h bar k, when we go to measure the momentum of the particle, we can potentially find any of those individual values. All we can predict ahead of time is the probability that we'll find one value or another when we make a measurement. And as you might have guessed, based on what we've discussed so far, the probability of finding k in a little window of width dk is given by the proportion of that Fourier wave squared, multiplied by the little width dk. Meanwhile, the probability of finding the position of the particle in a little window of width dx around a point x was given by psi of x squared times dx. We've therefore found a striking parallel between the position and momentum of the particle. Whereas psi of x squared tells us the probability density for finding the particle at position x, its Fourier transform squared is the probability density for finding the particle with momentum h bar k. We call psi of x the position space wave function to emphasize this, and psi hat of k the momentum space wave function. And they actually contain the same information about the system, since we can get either one from the other by applying the Fourier transform. 
So we could just as well write the fundamental rules of quantum mechanics in terms of the momentum space wave function. It's just a different way of packaging the information about the state of the particle. Abstractly, the quantum state is given by a vector called the state vector. And the position and momentum space wave functions are just two different representations of that same vector in the position basis and the momentum basis. There's a lot more to explain there to make it clear what that means, but that'll have to wait for another video. For now, I think we'd better take a look at a concrete example. And it's also going to lead us to a sneak peek at the uncertainty principle, like I promised at the very beginning. Let's go back to our earlier wave function that described a particle localized inside a region of space around the origin, let's say from minus a to a. With this wave function, the particle has an equal chance of being found anywhere inside this interval, and zero probability anywhere else. And I'm going to set the height to 1 over the square root of 2a. That's to ensure that the square of the wave function has got an area of 1 underneath it, since that's the total probability of finding the particle anywhere. So that's our position space wave function, psi of x. And now let's see what the momentum space wave function looks like by taking the Fourier transform. The integral's actually not too bad. First of all, we don't have to integrate from minus infinity to infinity because the wave function is zero everywhere except in this window from minus a to a. So we only have to integrate from minus a to a. And within that range, the wave function is a constant, one over the square root of 2a. So we can pull that straight outside the integral. Then all that's left is this fairly simple integral. We'll get one over minus ik from the exponent, and then we'll get back the exponential evaluated between the two endpoints of the integral. That's e to the minus ika minus e to the plus ika. But using Euler's identity again, we can simplify all that as the sine of ka times two over k. The twos cancel, and we're left with 1 over the square root of pi a times the sine of ka divided by k. And there we have it. That's the Fourier transform of this particular wave function, where each point on this graph is telling us how much that particular Fourier wave e to the ikx contributes to this given psi of x. Earlier, when we considered the periodic version of this wave function on a circle, the Fourier coefficients were a discrete list of data points. But now that we've graduated to an infinite domain, we have to sum over all the continuous values of k along this curve. It's oscillatory because of the factor of sine, but the amplitude decays because of the factor of 1 over k. That means that when you go to measure the momentum of the particle, you're most likely to find it in this window around zero, since that's where the square of the momentum space wave function is going to be dominated. In particular, these first zeros of the momentum space wave function occur when k equals plus or minus pi over a, since that's when the sine vanishes. Then notice that whereas the width of the position space wave function went like a, the characteristic width of the momentum space wave function goes like 1 over a. That's our first glimpse of the uncertainty principle. To understand it better, let's consider the two extreme limits, when a is really tiny and when it's huge. First, let's see what happens when a is very small, so that the window in position space where the particle hangs out becomes very narrow, and correspondingly very tall, because remember, the total area under the square of the wave function is fixed to 1. So, when we go to measure the position of the particle, in this limit we're guaranteed to find it very, very close to x equals 0. But what about when we measure the momentum? When a is small, we can apply the small angle approximation for sine, which means that the sine of ka is very nearly equal to ka again. Then the k's cancel, and the momentum space wave function becomes approximately constant, the square root of a over pi. A very small constant, because we're looking at the limit where a itself is very small. What's happened is that by shrinking a down so that the position space wave function becomes a very narrow spike, the momentum space wave function inversely gets stretched out, and looks almost flat, at least for a very wide range of k's, again up to about 1 over a. It'll eventually decay away to zero there, but in between it's essentially constant over a large range of wave numbers. And that means that when we go to measure the momentum of the particle, we have an equal chance of getting any of those values of k times h bar, since the probability function is likewise a constant, independent of k. 
In other words, by pinning down the location of the particle in space, we haven't got a clue what value we'll find when we measure the momentum. We could get any number h bar k with equal probability. You can guess what happens in the opposite limit when a is very large, meaning that the particle has room to spread out across a big region in position space. Now it's the momentum space wave function that develops a very tall spike at k equals zero. Remember, the width of the position space wave function was set by a, which is large in this limit. But the width of the momentum space wave function went like one over a, which is very small. Then this time, we can predict the momentum very precisely. But we have no idea what position we'll find the particle at when we go to measure it. This is the uncertainty principle. The better we can pin down the particle's position in space, the less we can say about what its momentum will be, and vice versa. If we know the momentum precisely, the position could be anywhere at all. This is a very general feature at the heart of quantum mechanics, and here we've seen how it emerges inevitably from the Fourier transform. For more details about the role of the Fourier transform in quantum mechanics, you can pull up my notes for this video at the link in the description. And you should also make sure that you're signed up for my newsletter for fun little physics lessons that I send out every week or two. I want to say a huge thank you to my Patreon sponsors for helping to make this video possible. You can join too at the link up in the corner if you want to see more videos like this. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you soon for another physics lesson.